B.A. Wilcox leaned against a cartonwood trunk and watched Francis Mason's nervous fussing, half amused and half exasperated. B.A. was a grim man, lean and hard as jacked buffalo beef, with hair and beard the color of melting snow in a chinook. He was not completely relaxed as he stood there, smoking his stub of a pipe. No man lived in Injun country very long after he stopped watching for trouble, and Bihei had been there for forty years. With a casual movement he glanced back the way they had come, toward the army fort, two days ride north. Danger could come to this rendezvous from that direction if the major guessed that Mason was looking for Cheyennes, but nothing stirred across the prairie. Danger could come from the south, too, from the Cheyenne camp that was down there or had been, a week earlier. The good thing about waiting under the cartonwoods was that, if trouble came, a man could see its dust far off. Bihe scorned the man who had hired him, this Francis Mason from Philadelphia, but he admitted that the Greenhorn had courage and determination. Also, he had money. He paid for what he got. For two years the Easterner had been searching for his lost brother, at trading posts and army forts all along the frontier. Francis Mason sat down to smoke but did not finish the pipe. He went over and fussed again with the arrangement of the gifts he had laid out on a blanket, moving the carbines, the red cloth, the beads and the knives so everything would show up to best advantage. When did he say he would come? Mason demanded. Never said he'd come at all. Behe Wilcox growled. Said maybe somebody would come, sometime. He added. If he does come, he'll bring an interpreter. He don't talk English, only Cheyenne, and sign. You speak Cheyenne. Mason argued. Why does he need an interpreter? Behe shrugged. Why should he trust me? I'm a white man. How could he be my brother Charles? Mason demanded in an arguing sort of way. Charles was well educated. He wrote poetry. The green book on the blanket contains the poems he left. We had them published. I never promised to bring any brother of yours to this rendezvous. B.A. reminded him. The man I talk to is a Cheyenne war chief. And after a while, he thought, I'll get around to telling you what he was when I first knew him, 30 years ago. The Cheyenne war chief, Bihe reflected complacently, had been making medicine on the other side of that yellow hill since noon. By the flight of a bird he knew someone was there. By the thin streamer of smoke he knew there was a medicine fire. The fact that he had seen these things was a good sign. When Injuns wanted to keep hidden, there was nothing to see. Francis Mason murmured. The mark you said was on his cheek. The big red mark as if a man's hand had been pressed there. How many men like that would there be in the world? Only one thought Bihe Wilcox. And the white man who had it used to call it the mark of Cain. He answered, Injun's paint. You know that. It's his medicine, that red hand is. A man goes out on a hill, and starves himself to get a vision, or he goes through the torture at the pole, and his dream tells him his medicine. All I said I'd do was take a message to a Cheyenne with a red hand on his face, and promise him presents if he'd come here for you to talk to. And I done it and I liked to lost my hair when his young men came out to meet me. He takes a risk, coming so far with no war party. Behe reminded Mason. 
but he wouldn't let me take you near his camp. He protects his people. And wouldn't the Major like to ride out and catch him here? Behe reflected. For years the army had tried to get Medicine Mark to come in and touch the pen to a treaty, but the message he sent was always the same, an arrow with blood dried on it. The army still wanted Medicine Mark, but not to talk of treaties. B.A. leaned against the cartonwood trunk, waiting for time to pass, aware that the thin streamer of smoke was gone, and feeling the sun work on his stiffening joints. He wouldn't come. B.A. said, If I hadn't promised him guns and ammunition. The horses, they're for show, and the rest is for pretty. Except the things Mason had put on the blanket to trap him, Behe thought. Might work, too. It might. The cunning man from Philadelphia. The VO spinning a web. Was it an accident that in the Cheyenne tongue VO meant white man as well as spider? The VO said, as if he had read Behe's mind. As I told you, I'd pay a thousand dollars to the man who could bring me my brother. Behe grunted. The VO's web was hung with gold, enough to keep a man in comfort for quite a while. Comfort was a thing a mountain man did not think about, except when he happened to have it. But when his occupation was gone with the fur trade, and his youth gone with the years, when his ancient wounds irked him, and supple joints were stiffening, what then for one who had been a mountain man? The army had no use on its civilian payroll for a scout too stiff to ride all day or a hunter who brought in little meat. But a man with a thousand dollars for a stake, a man who knew Indian trading, Behe started planning what stock a trader should have. Francis Mason shivered and looked back the way they had come. I've been watching. Behe informed him. Nothing's coming from that way. But somebody's going to come around that yellow hill yonder in a few minutes. Wished you'd sat down and act like it didn't matter. After a while he remarked. There comes two engines. He fired his rifle in the air and walked forward, away from the fire, shouting in Cheyenne. Welcome, friends. Welcome. That gunshot greeting, the ancient sign of peace, was pointless in these modern times. When Behe was young, and the rifle was a flintlock hawken, the greeting emptied it, and proved goodwill. Now he carried a Henry with five cartridges remaining in the magazine. The greeting was nothing but a lie. Behe had met a lot of lies in his lifetime. The whole meeting was risky, and he did not welcome danger with the high heart of a young man. But the risk was worthwhile. Mason had paid him for arranging the rendezvous, would pay him another thousand dollars when he said, That's the man you're looking for. Besides, Behe was going to learn the answer to a riddle that had been fretting him for thirty years. Why such a man as Kane had come west in the first place, and why he had turned Injun. The two riders greeted him from far off, a lithe young Cheyenne, perhaps seventeen, almost naked because he had not yet enough war honors to show up in his costume, and a stately older man who had about all the war honors a man was likely to live long enough to earn. There's medicine, Mark. Behe announced. The young one is his third son, rules his horses. He'll interpret. Mason had not thought of asking how a young Indian might have learned English if he had never lived with white men. Looking at the haughty youth, and at the stately warrior, Behe was wrenched with envy. If I'd kept a woman, he realized, instead of sending M back to their father's lodges, the Shoshone girl, them two hunk-papas, 
The crow I called Sally, even that re that come near talking me to death, if I'd kept one of them for more than just a winter, I'd have boys of my own by now to bring in meat. No need for the Vio's Judah's money then. But I sent him back, and my sons, if I had any, went with them. I wonder how many tall half-blood boys of mine are living in the peaked lodges. But I never could stay with them. I couldn't turn Injun. By God, I'm still a white man. A Vio myself. He smiled meagerly, glancing slit-eyed at the chief, Medicine Mark, hating him for what he had. The Cheyenne warrior's hair hung in two grey braids wrapped in otter skin. The medicine mark was vivid, a great red hand printed on the side of the brown, seamed face. From slits in his ears hung silver medals. He wore the insignia of courage proved in many battles, the costume that could be bought only with boldness, and with blood. So fully proved in Valor that he could afford not to boast too much about it, he did not wear an eagle feather war bonnet. The war shirt told enough, the buckskin shirt fringed with human hair. Francis Mason stepped forward with a quick sound that was not quite a name, and Behe warned. I'll talk. That's his war outfit is got on. Behe spoke at length piecing out the harsh, choking syllables of the Cheyenne tongue with accustomed gestures of the sign language. The man with the red hand on his cheek answered briefly. Behe explained to Mason. He says he can't stay. Just happened to come here. He spoke further, coaxing, gesturing toward the spread presents on the red blanket. The old warrior rode over and looked down at the gifts. He nodded, and got off his horse. A little lame now, eh? Behe thought, meanly pleased to see him limp. But you got sons to make your meat, and a woman to cook it. The young Indian picketed the horses, and came back, his chin up, and his eyes wary, never letting go of his rifle. Part of the metal of the side plate was missing, replaced with hardened hide. Behe Wilcox said, This man is Mason. Will you smoke with us? The young man answered. He says yes. Behe took a stone pipe from his possible sack, and filled, and lighted it with proper ceremony. He was relieved when they were through smoking when Mason had finished his awkward performance with the pipe. Now you can talk. He told the Easterner. Mason had been staring at the old Cheyenne. Now he said to the young one, with complete confidence, Tell him I am his brother Francis. Behe was embarrassed, but the young man translated, and answered steadily, he does not know you. He does not know what you mean. His brothers are the Cutarms, the Cheyennes. But the Mark? The Easterner cried. I know him by the red mark on his face. When the young man translated that, the old one launched into a longer speech. The young man replied, the great medicine gave him the mark so that no man would kill him. He does not know why you want to see him. He wants you to go away and leave him alone. Francis Mason cried in despair. Tell him father is dead. We want him to come home. He can't mourn with you. He does not know your father. He does not need to go home because this is his home, this place where we are, and farther than you can see. Where the Cheyennes go, there is his home, in the lodges of the Cut Arms. The old warrior moved as if to get up, and Behe thought. No. There's two things to find out yet. 
Why you came out here, old horse, you never told me, the winter we trapped together. And why you turned Injun, a thing I couldn't do myself. Francis Mason was staring at the old warrior with tears running down his cheeks, weeping without shame. At last he said the right thing. Humbly he asked, Will my brother the Cheyenne listen to my story? He will listen. He is sad that you have lost your brother. There was a duel, many years ago. Mason began. And a man was killed. Behe prompted him. Tell it easier. Duel's a hard word. Tell the story. And now, Behe rejoiced silently, I'm going to find out about a young fellow who called himself Cain because of the mark the Lord put on him. Mason tried again. Long ago two young men had a quarrel. I was one of them. The other man was named Corshawn. We said we would fight about it. We shot at each other with pistols when the sun came up. The man on my side was my half-brother, Charles. I shot the man named Corshawn, and he died. The old warrior had a question. Did the man who died have someone on his side, or was he alone? He had a friend, too. There was also a doctor, a medicine man. There were old rules to follow in a case like that. We followed the rules. The young man interpreted Medicine Mark's querulous reply. He does not understand what white men do. Was the man who died from an enemy tribe? Mason said in a choked voice. He had been my friend until we quarreled. Rules his horses interpreted with a tinge of superiority. Among the Cheyennes a man who kills another man of the tribe is put away from the people, because he has done a bad thing. My father does not understand. Mason's voice had pleading in it. Yes, it was a bad thing. We followed a custom that was against the law. My father said that someone had to be put outside the tribe. After a moment he was able to continue. He put Charles outside. He gave him money to go away and never come back. But the young man who was put outside, your brother, he had not killed anyone. He had not done anything wrong except be on my side in the fight. I asked him to do that. Then why did he go? Mason said slowly. He saw that he was not wanted. It made his heart sick. He must have hated us for what we did to him. The old warrior thought for a while, then spoke, and his son said, My father wants to know, did you try to stop your brother from going? I didn't know he was going, said Francis Mason. My father made me stay in my room, my lodge, and I didn't know until Charles was gone. He burst out. I should have gone after him then. I could have found out where he went. But I was afraid of my father. It is a bad thing to be afraid, but telling about it cleans the heart. The young man translated. My father does not understand. Among the Cheyennes, a son is not afraid of his father. He wonders why your father loved one of his sons more than the other. Because, Francis Mason said in a tone almost too low to be heard, because of the mark on my brother's face. It made him different from other men. A mark like a red hand. Like the mark on the face of my brother the Cheyenne war chief. And Francis Mason looked into each other's dark eyes. B.A. Wilcox, looking at the face of Cain, saw what the years had made of it. Otter, unconscious pride were in the tilt of the chin, 
endurance was in the set of the broad mouth. Morning and triumph had seamed the cheeks. Bihei noted the old man's honors and knew their making. The brown, tireless hands of an Indian woman had woven the dyed porcupine quills, sewed the beads, and tanned the soft buckskin of the scalp shirt. A medicine man had chanted prayers when the fringes of hair were affixed to the sleeve seams, and the hair came from an enemy, dead by the hand of medicine ma. I've lifted hair in my time, Bihe recollected, but I never went so far as to smoke the scalps or sing songs over M. The Cheyenne warrior murmured at length, and Rawls his horses said, he does not understand how a father could throw his son away. He would not do that with one of his sons. He tells you this story. Three years ago the Cheyennes had a fight with white soldiers. Five soldiers were killed, and the Cheyenne camp was surrounded. The white chief said he would shoot into the lodges, and kill women and children if he did not have five Cheyenne men to shoot. The Cheyennes who had killed the white soldiers had run away. But five Cheyenne warriors went to the fort anyway. The white soldiers killed them there. My oldest brother sang his death song that day. But it was not because my father did not want him anymore. It was because my brother was a brave man, not afraid to die for his people. Francis Mason murmured, my father was cruel, and I was afraid, and am ashamed. That is all I can say. B.A. Wilcox broke the silence finally, saying in English. Mason asked me to try to find a man with a red mark. That is why I went to the lodges of Medicine Mark's people. I know the warrior Medicine Mark. Rawls his horses answered, my father knows you, but he does not know a white man with a medicine mark on his face. Maybe the white man is dead. Bihe squinted toward the yellow hill, saw no danger signals there. He noted that medicine mark, like the younger man, was watching in the other direction for signs that might mean soldiers were coming. There had been smoking together, but in these days it meant truce, not friendship. Bihe said, I will tell a story of a long time ago. The Cheyenne war chief remembers when there were not many white men. I was a young man then, a trapper. I had a fight with some Pygans, lost everything, horses, and furs, and gun. The young Indian said, my father thinks you counted coup that day. Bihe smiled grimly. I counted coup four times before I ran. But I went hungry, because a man cannot eat scalps or anger. I came to the trading post after many days, but I had nothing to trade. I needed horses, traps, blankets, a gun, trade goods. I met a young white man at the fort who gave them to me. He had a red mark on his face like a hand. He said his name was Cain. Francis Mason gave Bihe a shocked look but managed not to speak. Cain never talked much. He had come up the river with trappers, looking for something, but he never said what he was looking for. He had learned to kill buffalo with a bow an arrow. He had a good rifle, a man-ton rifle, and nobody could see why he wanted to shoot with a bow. He talked to the Indians at the trading fort and learned some of their words. As the young Indian translated, Bihe observed that the old warrior made no move to hide the rifle across his knees. The shattered stock was wound with copper wire but the rifle was a man-ton. We spent a season trapping. Bihe went on. He wanted to learn how to live in the woods. 
When this was translated, the old man laughed shortly, and his son said, He says it is a joke. No one has to learn a thing like that. Everybody knows how to live in the woods. It was no joke for this young man I used to know. We trapped together, and sometimes we froze, and went hungry, but oftener we ate fat buffalo ribs. Once we fought the crows, and once Shoshones, and twice the Blackfeet chased us. Cain used to write in a little book. He wrote poetry in the book, be here recalled, but there's no hurry about telling that. Go ahead, old man, tell him you're his brother. It was not betrayal he had in mind, after all. It was going to be triumph for two men who were no longer young, for Behe Wilcox who needed a thousand dollars, and for the man who had been Charles Mason, who had been cast out by his own father. Go back home now with your hair in braids, and the ornaments sagging in your ears, Behe urged silently, and let them see what you've turned into. It's a chance to get even that few men ever have. Go back, and be Charles Mason after 30 years. Your woman is old. Your sons will look after her. Go back, and be a white man before you die. We headed south for the rendezvous in the spring. Behe went on. I had a Blackfoot arrowhead in my knee, and Cain cut it out with his green river knife, but the flesh rotted. I couldn't ride anymore, and there were Indians behind us. Cain was a brave man. He didn't know what Indians those were, but he went back, and met them, and he brought a medicine man to cure my wound. In four days I was well again, I could ride. Mason burst out. For the love of heaven, what happened to the white man? Don't interrupt. Behe growled. To Injuns, that's bad manners. He looked into the old warrior's face as he went on. I don't know what happened to the young man called Cain. I don't know what Indians those were. I was too sick to know, and when the fever went away, I was alone with my horses and fur packs. There would be time enough, a little later, to take back the part of that that was a lie. What Cain had said was, I'm not going on with you, Behe. I've found what I was looking for. I've found my own people. Behe knew at last what he had meant. And before they parted, Behe recollected, Cain had burned the little book he used to write in, and the Bible he carried in his possible sack. Behe said, If he is dead, my heart is heavy. He was a brave man. Medicine Mark spoke briefly, and his son said, My father tells you he was born a Cheyenne. Francis Mason looked stricken but said nothing. The young Indian went on. His father was Bull Man. His mother was She Sings. Bull Man, Behe thought. He had been mourning for his son. So that's who adopted Cain. The young Indian said. Medicine Mark says he was born in a lodge of the Cheyennes. Bull Man and She Sings were pleased with him because he was their son and he had the mark on his face. It was good medicine. It meant no enemy would kill him. Behe remembered something the young white man had said during that winter they trapped together. The Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should smite him. Medicine Mark got to his feet, and his son said, He will tell you a story. Chanting, with the dignified gestures of Indian oratory, the man whose grey braids were bound in otter skin spoke and rules his horses interpreted. 
When I was a young man, I was selfish. I was always looking for what I wanted, not for the good of other people. I went to war and brought back eight horses to the lodges of the Cheyennes. I wanted to have a wife. I wanted a girl named Grass Woman. All those horses I sent as a gift to her father stands tall. But he would not take them. B.A. thought. He was afraid you wouldn't stay with the tribe. He couldn't trust a white man. Cheyennes was always careful of their women. I made up my mind I would hang at the pole in the medicine lodge. Then maybe I would get the girl. Ballman was my teacher in the holy lodge. Ballman wanted me to have what I wanted. For four days I did not eat or drink, but prayed and sang. Then Ballman slit the skin on my breast and tied me to the pole, and I danced, but I could not break the skin. Francis Mason shuddered. I prayed to the wise one above to let me break the skin, but I could not. I hung at the pole until almost sunset. Then I had a vision. It was a red hand. I knew it was good medicine. While I hung there, my people brought gifts to hang on the thong that tied me to the pole, to make it heavier, to help me break away. My mother, she sings, laid on the thong a painted robe for a gift to the poor. Her sisters laid on it other heavy things. My heart was strong then, to know how much they gave to let me be free. I pulled harder, but the skin was too tough to break. Then grass woman came, the girl I wanted for my wife. On the thong she tied a very valuable present for the poor, a heavy kettle. Then I knew she wanted me, and her father would take the horses. I felt the great heart of my people, the cut arms. I broke away, and the spirit left my body, but the hands of bull man caught me, and did not let me fall. I was born again. Since that time I have not been selfish. I tried to help my people. He sat down by the fire and covered his face with his blanket. Francis Mason sat with his hands gripped into fists, staring at the Cheyenne warrior with an expression between horror and admiration. Behe himself was as close to feeling horror as he ever got. Injuns go through the torture, he meditated, but I never heard of a white man doing it. Francis Mason said wearily, with more courtesy than Behe had expected of him. I thank my brother the Cheyenne warrior for telling me the story. I wish my brother would come home with me. There was no hope in his voice, no belief, only stubbornness. Rules his horses, translated. Medicine Mark thanks his white brother, but he cannot go. It is too far, and he must look after his people. They have enemies, and sometimes they are hungry because the buffalo herds are hard to find. My father thinks the young man named Cain is dead a long time. Francis Mason nodded slowly without speaking. He glanced at Behe Wilcox, asking for instructions about ending the talk, but Behe waited. The end was for Medicine Mark to decide, because he had the most honors, the greatest prestige. And he was well aware of it. He spoke, and his son interpreted. Medicine Mark says now he will look at the white man's presence, given because he came so far to talk. The grey-braided Cheyenne walked with dignity to the spread gifts on the blanket. Medicine Mark picked up the three sharps carbines, one by one, nodding and murmuring, and handed them to his son. He examined the powder, the lead, the percussion caps, the bullet molds, and good, strong knives. 
He took up the razor awkwardly, with an admiring exclamation, rubbed his thumb across the edge, and cut himself. He sucked his thumb like a surprised child. B.A. Wilcox said in Cheyenne, That gift is from me to my Cheyenne brother. That brotherhood, he reflected, was worth a thousand dollars. Medicine Mark answered in the same tongue. An old man's face is tender, and when hair grows on a man's face he must pull it out. Indians don't have much hair on their faces. Bihe reminded him, but the war chief answered patiently. I was born a Cheyenne when I hung at the pole. Francis Mason looked suspicious, and Bihe spoke English again. The three good ponies are gifts also from Mason. Medicine Mark took his time looking over the ponies. He nodded acceptance. He handed his son more of the things from the blanket, the bolt of red cloth, the sacks of colored beads, the mirrors, and awls, and strong needles for sewing skins. Bihe said, Those are for Medicine Mark's wife, grass woman, if he wants to give them to her. There was nothing left on the blanket except the items that were the traps, the web spun by the spider. Now, thought Bihe, is the time you can get even. My pa whipped me, and I ran away, but he never put me out the way yours did. Now tell Francis Mason the truth. Whether you do it or I do, I get my thousand dollars. And you get your revenge. He watched the man in the Cheyenne war shirt, and felt the tenseness of Francis Mason. Medicine Mark bent at last to pick up the gold locket. He should have taken it before. Perhaps even the Greenhorn knew that an Indian would not delay so long before taking that small, bright bauble. This is a miniature of Charles' mother. Francis had said when he laid it there. The Cheyenne war chief let the locket turn on its gold chain, and glimpsed the painting of a smiling white woman, long ago dead. But he looked without comprehension. How long, Bihe wondered, was he going to go on playing with the Easterner? Ah, the long patience, the cunning cruelty of a hating Indian. Medicine Mark tossed the locket to his son. It was only something bright to hang on a warrior's neck among beads, and bear claws, and small bird's feathers. He picked up the big silver watch, hanging from its chain, and looked at it with innocent admiration. Hearing it tick, he put it to his ear. With an exclamation of dismay, and anger, he threw it as far as he could. Francis Mason gasped. Medicine Mark scolded, and Bihe translated. He says that must be bad medicine or it wouldn't talk. Only living things talk, and ghosts. He don't want anything to do with white men's ghosts. The Cheyenne warrior stood scowling, and suspicious, glaring at Francis Mason. Then he turned his back. Twice he had evaded the web of the spider, but one more thing remained on the blanket, the small green book. He picked it up carefully, clumsily, with hands accustomed to the bow, and the knife, hands that had dripped blood to match the red hand on his face. Bihe drew in a slow breath, and held it as Medicine Mark politely examined the small book. He held it far away, he held it close, he turned it around, riffled the pages reverently, as one handles a sacred object, a religious charm of feathers, and fur. Do you see the name Charles Mason on the front in gold? Bihe wondered. The spider's web wavered but it caught nothing. Bihe saw that the eyes of the Cheyenne were blind too. The gold lettering of a white man's name. The Cheyenne's pride was strong. 
He had suffered in the medicine lodge. He had hung at the pole, and the hearts of the cut arms had beat with him, and helped him tear free, and he had been born again. He had hungered with his people, and bled from wounds in battle and from cuts self-made on his body to win the favor of spirits. He had endured with the Cheyennes, and he could also endure never to have the book the white man would have prized. Medicine Mark handed the book of Charles Mason's poems to his brother Francis, saying politely in Cheyenne, Maybe there is medicine in this for white men, but I don't know. It is not for my people. B. A. Wilcox wanted to yell, but he choked it down. After all his horses had wrapped up the gifts in the blanket and tied them to one of the horses, the old warrior made another speech. I can't understand the white men, and I don't want to see them anymore. They kill the buffalo, and my people go hungry. They shoot my young men, and our women wail in the lodges. Our children have no fathers to make meat. I don't want to see any more white men. I will kill all I can until I die. Mason should go back to his own place, and mourn for his brother. I think the Pawnees killed that man when he was young. I was born a Cheyenne. My father was Bull Man, my mother was She Sings. I have gone to war many times. I used to go to war with only a lance, to show I was not afraid to die. But now I go to war with guns because I am afraid my people will die. The warrior went on, chanting, swaying. The hair fringe swung on the sleeves of his war shirt, and the sun shone on the red hand on his face and on the scars of the sacrifice cuts across his arms. I wear the war shirt. It is a heavy burden. A man who wears it must always be at the front in battle, he must be the last to go back. He must look after his people, and give them what they need. He must never be angry if one of his people does wrong to him. A man took two horses from me, but I forgave him, and gave him another horse. I keep peace among my people. I would like to put off the war shirt, but my people need me. I will wear it as long as I can. When Rule his horses had finished translating, Medicine Mark said, Now we will go back. Awkwardly, an Indian trying to imitate white men's ceremonies, the warrior shook hands with Mason and Behe Wilcox. To each he said in Cheyenne, My brother, goodbye. He turned away. Behe watched him go, thinking, I gave him his chance, and he wouldn't take it. I can still call him back. Mason can't hurt him. All I need to do is say, This is the man. And I've got a thousand dollars. He glared after the Indians, who were getting on their ponies, and he argued silently. He saved my life that time, but it's paid for with the carbines. The words formed in his mouth, but no sound came. He sighed and said, The young man I used to know must have died long ago. A man that took chances like he did wouldn't last long. Francis Mason asked, That hair on his sleeves is that. Injun scalps, and he took him himself. Mason said flatly, there were two men in the world with that birthmark, then. My brother Charles could never have become a savage. And I was so hopeful. So sure. The Indians, leading the extra ponies, had almost reached the yellow hill. Francis Mason brooded. Strange, with all those hideous customs, that a heathen savage should follow the rules the old man mentioned, 
such as having to forgive one of his own people who does him wrong, because he wears the war shirt. A kind of Indian version of the golden rule. Bihe said harshly, that man was born in a Cheyenne camp. He never heard of the golden rule. The two Indians disappeared at last around the yellow hill. As Bihe went forward, a little lame, to get his horse, and the greenhorns, he understood finally why he could not speak to claim the Judah's money. We go by different rules, the old war chief, and me, Bihe thought. He goes by the Indian way he chose, but me, by God, I'm still civilized. <laughs>